Why is the world sinking? What exactly is the Mother Flame? And how does this all relate to Joy Boy, the world's first pirate? Hello my Nakamatachi, this is Joy Girl, and today we're embarking on a journey to uncover the truth of the Void Century and the events surrounding Joy Boy, the Ancient Kingdom, and Imu. As the Egghead Island reaches its climax, One Piece readers have been receiving massive lore dumps left, right, and center. From the fact that the entire world is sinking, the appearance of the Mother Flame being stored inside a tank within Egghead Island, to perhaps the biggest reveal of all, the fact that Joy Boy is the world's first pirate. But I actually have to admit that the thing that interested me the most about this reveal that Joy Boy was the world's first pirate wasn't actually that Joy Boy was the world's first pirate. Pirate. What? Don't get me wrong, that was a momentous lore drop that certainly caused a lot of surprise and excitement. But if we're being honest, I think a lot of my shock was more my disbelief that this sort of deep lore was being revealed at this point in the story. Sort of a, I can't believe we're finally finding out more about Joy Boy, more so than, I can't believe Joy Boy was the first pirate. I think given what we know about the Void Century and Joy Boy already, we probably could have assumed that Joy Boy was indeed the first pirate already, or the fact that he was doesn't seem so incapable of belief now. But the reveal did certainly pique my interest, particularly in terms of two questions. One, what does it even mean for Joy Boy to have been the first pirate? And two, what did Vegapunk mean when he said that it's not up to him to judge on whether the individual responsible for his death is good or bad? So let's begin. To answer this first question, I think it's all also worth noting that a word only has meaning because we give it a meaning. And the word pirate is no different. In our real world, this word pirate first appeared in English around the 1300s despite piracy as a concept existing since antiquity. Even from 14th century BC, there were accounts of sea people who threatened ships sailing in the Aegean and Mediterranean waters. This word is even derived from the ancient Greek word pater meaning a person who attempts something, over time being used to describe a brigand who operates on the seas, so I guess a person who attempts to steal. But over time and to different cultures, piracy has meant different things. For example, in ancient Greece, piracy was once condoned as a viable profession, a widespread commonplace way to make a living. With ancient classical texts like Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey referencing the abduction of women and children for the slave trade as common practice. However, by the end of the classical era, piracy was looked down on as a disgraceful profession. Which goes to show that depending on the context and surrounding social values, being a pirate can signify different things. Even in the One Piece universe, being a pirate means different things to different characters. For Luffy, it means freedom and adventure. For Bellamy, piracy meant treasure and beating up other sea travelers to hoard more of it. For the marines, pirates represent the enemy, criminals that must be brought to justice. For ordinary citizens, pirates are villains, wreaking havoc and causing tragedy with their plunder and greed. In fact, in Romance Dawn, or even both versions of Romance Dawn, the prototype one-shots released prior to the final development of One Piece, Oda actually categorized the different types of pirates as the Morganeers and Peace Mains. Morganeers referred to a particular class of violent pirates who sail the seas for personal gain and treasure, looting and fighting, whereas the Peace Mains were pirates who fight the Morganeers and sail the seas for adventure. And although this concept of having two types of pirates is something Oda once seriously considered, enough to keep it in both versions of Romance Dawn, it didn't quite stick, and it's not a concept that exists explicitly in the One Piece canon. And while the depiction of pirates in the series has been a little more nuanced than a straight up dichotomy between the Morganese and Peace Mains, I do think that generally speaking, this idea of there being two types of pirates, the bad guys and the good guys, is something that is still quite clear to see. Straw Hats would 
would represent peace means, whereas someone like Crocodile could be considered a Morganeer. So then in a world where being a pirate means many things, what does it mean that Joy Boy was the first pirate? And if the term pirate didn't even exist before Joy Boy, then who came up with it? It is said in chapter 1114 that Joy Boy was called a pirate and not that he called himself a pirate, suggesting that it's not a title that he himself came up with. So is this a title that the 20 Kingdoms, or later the world government created, to brand Joy Boy as a pirate, denouncing all those who sail the seas as evil, no good thieves? Now I can't answer that for sure, but I do have a feeling that this dual nature of piracy is a critical part of figuring out the story of Joy Boy and the truth of the Void Century. Which then leads us to the second question. What did Vegapunk mean when he said he can't judge Imu's virtue? But before we delve into this second question, if you've liked the discussion so far, then please hit the like button and also subscribe to the channel. I really love discussing One Piece and your support by liking and subscribing helps me to do so more often and I would really be very grateful. So a little more context. In chapter 1113, as Vegapunk is breaking the earth-shattering news to the world that the world as everyone knows it is sinking into the sea, he also shared that if this message is being broadcast, that means his heart has stopped and the powers that be have killed him for his sins. But interestingly, the scientist also comments that he doesn't want the world to judge the person responsible for his death as being someone that's evil. In fact, Vegapunk says that he himself is unable to judge right from wrong in this case. Now this piece of dialogue seems to have been mostly looked over in recent times and understandably so. Given the scale of the news that he shared after, i.e. the whole world sinking as well as the reveal of the mother flame and Joy Boy being the first pirate. These reveals in subsequent chapters have taken center stage, but I do think this line requires further consideration. Here Vegapunk seems to be essentially saying that he can't say whether Imu's decision to exterminate him for researching the truth of the Void Century is right or wrong. He says he doesn't know enough about Imu to make that call. And this line is significant for a couple of reasons. For one, it indicates that Vegapunk does know of the existence of Imu, but the way that he talks about Imu suggests that he only knows them vaguely. It seems that he doesn't know Imu's name, he calls Imu a he despite Imu's gender being unconfirmed at this stage, meaning that this could be just an assumption, but he also doesn't know of all of Imu's intentions or justifications. But he does know that there is a higher power above that of the Gorosei that is calling the shots, an individual that stands on top of the world government, which is very important as it makes Vegapunk one of the very, very few characters to know of Imu's existence. Secondly, this piece of dialogue, I can't help but think, is very similar to something Rayleigh said over 500 chapters ago. In chapter 507, Rayleigh tells the Straw Hats that the answer they come to after finding the One Piece may be different to the one that he and the Roger Pirates came to all those years ago. And this is a mysterious line that has evaded us for over a decade. But I have always interpreted it to mean that when we find out the true history and the truth about the Void Century, it won't be so easy to discern right from wrong. The answer to the question of why the 20 Kingdoms chose to overthrow one great kingdom will be complex and not so easy to answer, which is a statement true to One Piece more generally. The way that Oda has crafted his characters, we are rarely, if ever, presented with one-dimensional figures who represent pure good or pure evil. This is perhaps best seen through villains like Arlong or Doflamingo, reprehensible characters who've committed so many wrongs and caused so much harm to some of our favorite characters, but also individuals with incredibly heavy backstories that make them so layered and complicated. No one can argue that what Arlong did to the Kokoyashi village was despicable. But you also can't argue that Arlong too was, in his own way, a victim of his own context, being born a fishman in a world filled with prejudice. Perhaps without the racial divide, Arlong may have grown up differently, viewing humans differently. The same way that Doflamingo might not have been so messed up if it wasn't for how he and his family were treated or even our own protagonist Luffy. Despite acting like a hero in many situations, his actions 
emotions aren't always purely good, a fact that he proudly and wholeheartedly admits. Luffy does not try, nor does he want to be a hero. So then if we go back to Vegapunk's dialogue, understanding the complex nature of Oda's storytelling leads me to believe that the truth behind the Void Century and the conflict between the Ancient Kingdom and the Twenty Kingdoms, or even Imu and Joy Boy as individuals will be just as multifaceted. Vegapunk can't say for sure whether Imu is a bad guy or not, even though he doesn't agree with the world government's actions in keeping the truth of the world's history a secret. Suggesting that what Vegapunk knows of the world's history may shine Imu and the Twenty Kingdoms motivations in a more sympathetic light. Imu and his or her part in the Twenty Kingdoms in opposing Joy Boy and the Ancient Kingdom may even have been justified. And for me, the only way, or at least the most likely way this makes sense, is if the Ancient Kingdom was up to no good. Actually, scratch that. We're all about nuance today. Let me rephrase. The Ancient Kingdom was not purely good. Just like Oda's initial ideas for piracy consisting of the Morganeers and the Peace Mains, we've also seen that the D family consists of the good guys and the bad guys. D wielders like Luffy, and others like Blackbeard. We also know that D is the moniker of the world government's enemy, meaning that the D is the name given to those of the Ancient Kingdom because the Ancient Kingdom is the enemy of the Twenty Kingdom that went on to form the world government. Which is to say that it seems like the Ancient Kingdom consisted of citizens, some of whom were good, others that were bad. But maybe the Twenty Kingdoms didn't care to make this distinction between those who needed opposing. In their eyes, the ancient kingdom represented an evil kingdom, all of whom needed to be stopped. But what could the ancient kingdom have been doing that justified an extermination on the scale of destroying an entire kingdom? Why erase all traces of this kingdom and their advanced technology from the history books? Well, I think the answer to that question was given to us in the very same chapter, 1113. The ancient kingdom was causing the world to sink. We know that that Imu and the world government's use of the Mother Flame is what caused a major earthquake and rising sea levels recently. We know that the Mother Flame is an invention created by Vegapunk in an attempt to create an energy source that would mirror the energy source that was available to the Ancient Kingdom, meaning that the Ancient Kingdom may have had its own Mother Flame or another energy source that is very similar, perhaps, nay, likely to be even stronger than the Mother Flame. And so say that the Ancient Kingdom initially intended to use this energy source for legitimate, non-harmful reasons. A way to power their advanced technology. But why don't we just call a spade a spade? In creating the Mother Flame, it seems that Oda has been heavily influenced by nuclear power. And nuclear power, similar to the Mother Flame, can be used simply as an energy source, but it can also be used as a weapon. Nuclear energy is a much more efficient way of producing energy than traditional fossil fuels because it requires requires less fuel to power nuclear plants and therefore creates less waste. In weapon form, it also has explosive destructive capability, being known as a weapon of mass destruction. And Oda, being Japanese, knows very well the extremely catastrophic consequences of using nuclear power source as a weapon. So then what happens when a handful of people in the ancient kingdom, the not so wholesome, not so well-intentioned citizens, decide to engage in testing this infinite source of power for weapons use? How does the rest of the world react? Is it then justified for the 20 kingdoms to take action? To oppose the ancient kingdom that is playing with something very dangerous, very powerful? And even if the ancient kingdom tries to argue, hey, we're not all trying to abuse this energy, we're using it for good purposes. Maybe the other kingdoms decide, we can't take that chance. That's too great a gamble. Eventually breaking out into an all-out war. Maybe this is also why the world government initially saw it appropriate to hide all traces of the ancient kingdom and to curtail the advancement of technology to make sure no one would develop a power source as dangerous as this ever again. The world government or the 20 kingdoms were initially well-intentioned, but then, as we've seen in history countless of times, those in charge get high on their own power and authority and become corrupted, keeping the world 
in the dark becomes less about global harmony and safety and more about their own centralized control. As we've seen now with Imu, Imu has armed the mother flame, engaging in the same dangerously harmful activity that they opposed the ancient kingdom for 800 years ago. The initial goals and intentions of the world government becoming lost and forgotten. Oda presenting us with a didactic series warning us of the corruptible nature of power. And so it's at this moment that Vegapunk decides that he needs to take action. After working for the world government for decades, this sign of megalomania, the use of the mother flame for destructive purposes once again, it's not something that he can just stand by. Maybe this also explains why someone like Nefertari Lily initially joined the other 20 kingdoms or the other 19 kingdoms. Originally believing that putting a stop to this dangerous use of power was necessary, only to realize later on that it's equally wrong to punish a whole kingdom and decimate an entire people for this reason, and also that one of the 20 kingdom, Imu of the Nerona family, was getting quite power hungry and taking the new world into a direction that would not mean global peace and harmony. But then what does this all have to do with the world sinking, or the fact that Joy Boy was the world first pirate. Well, I think that this all comes down to devil fruits. Egghead has been chock-a-block full of lore that it's almost hard to keep track of all the different reveals. But back in chapter 1069, Oda teased us with another piece of dialogue from Dr. Vegapunk. As the scientist marveled at Luffy's gear fifth form, he shared with the Straw Hats what was his theory on the origins and mechanics of devil fruits. That each devil fruit represents a possibility for human evolution that someone desired in ancient times. They represent the many branches of the future of humanity, but it is an unnatural status or ability and is therefore loathed by the sea. And the sea, being the mother of nature, has punished those with devil fruit abilities by making them permanently defenseless to the sea. And it is important to know that this is only Vegapunk's theory, but why would Oda include these details unless it bore at least some truth? So then if we unpack this concept, the first thing I want to note is that Vegapunk says that devil fruit abilities are unnatural. People didn't just organically develop these powers from their imagination, they were brought into existence through human interference. And based on what we know, the only people who would have the technology to be able to create these devil fruits would have been the people of the ancient kingdom. And I'm also going to guess that they were using their infinite power source to create these devil fruits. But here's the thing about nuclear energy. Even though it is a much more efficient form of energy, it is not considered a renewable energy source. The material used in nuclear power plants to create nuclear energy is not renewable. Nuclear energy also produces radioactive waste, which is very harmful for both humans and the environment. Meaning that we could have a similar situation going on in One Piece. Even prior to the Ancient Kingdom's use of the energy source for weaponry, and armament purposes, this power source may have been endangering the environment already. We know that the creation of artificial devil fruits by Vegapunk and the attempt by Caesar has been a resource intensive affair. And I can only imagine that it would have been the same for the Ancient Kingdom if not for their infinite power source, which means that it would have been creating quite a lot of waste. And maybe this use of the energy source was contributing negatively to the environment by causing rising sea levels, hence the natural limitation to devil fruits, nature's way of fighting back against this unnatural human development that was creating so much waste and resulting rising sea levels was to make such devil fruit users vulnerable to the consequences of their own actions. Or maybe it's even an inherent limitation that the ancient kingdoms set on themselves by intentionally creating a weakness to seawater in an attempt to curtail their unfettered use of the energy source source for devil fruit creation because of its adverse effects on the environment. Either way, the ancient kingdom, many of whom had devil fruits, now had to sail the seas, being differentiated from other people as having lost the capacity to swim. Perhaps the ancient kingdom's citizens' vulnerability to the water and their method of transportation by ships became a defining feature of the ancient kingdom, including Joy Boy, who as an individual heavily implied to have the same nickname devil fruit as Luffy is likely to have been the leader of the ancient kingdom prior to the void century. And so, 
Then, following the events of the Void Century, his method of sailing the seas became vilified. All those of the ancient kingdom become branded as pirates, brigands and no-gooders out to steal and loot and cause harm. The truth about the different types of people who made up the ancient kingdom being obscured, all of them being painted under the one broad stroke as evil pirates. Which may then also explain why Vegapunk decides that he can't be judging whether Imu was right or wrong. He admits that his study of the Poneglyphs, his creation of the Mother Flame are his sins. Despite not feeling remorseful because he believes in the advancement of technology, if he understands that use of this energy source is bad for the environment, especially when it's not being curtailed and limited, he knows he also played a part in the world's undoing. But I have to say, and I am going to have to copy a line out of Vegapunk's dialogue here, this is only my theory. So now I'm going to turn this on to you. Let me know what you think. Leave a comment below on your thoughts on what happened during the Void Century, why Joy Boy was called a pirate, how it relates to the world sinking. If you've liked today's discussion, please give me a like, subscribe to the channel for more discussions, and please do become a member to support the channel further. Thank you to our current Patreon and channel members. This is Joy Girl, and I'll see you again soon.